Hi, my name's Chell Benner. I'm here for Hot Licks Tapes to tell you about polyphonic tapping. Now, what this is, it's not by playing the bass, usually. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be tapping notes onto the bass, which gives you a lot more possibilities, and you can expand any kind of thing, like you can play chords, or you can play melodies and accompaniment, whatever. But what we're going to do is we're going to look through a whole reign of that. We're going to find out how to do it, and then we're going to find out how it applies, okay? And I want to tell you about polyphonic. What polyphonic means is that you can play two melodies or three melodies at once, simultaneously, where normally a bass player was stuck playing just one note at a time, you know, like the old groove lines or whatever it is. But now you're tapping, you can hit chords, you can play notes together, anything like that, because you're, what you're doing is each hand can play its own part. But you have to be very careful because it's a pretty involved technique. Now the old lines, the one note bass lines, they call that homophonic, and now polyphonic means many more, the more voices and stuff like that. So what you have to do with this technique though, you have to learn music. The thing is, you know, you can, you can be playing something, you can learn how to do the technique, but you might get like all kinds of weird notes because you don't know what notes go together. So you're gonna have to learn music like keyboard players or guitarists who, or anybody else who plays like more notes at one time. You have to learn chords. And that, that might involve is going to a teacher and learning about the basic things, major scales, minor scales, uh, you know, chords, how things are built. We're gonna go through a little of this, but it's gonna be easier for you to pick it up from a teacher that where you're studying with him for weeks or whatever. Also, you can look at books. There's a lot of theory books about music. There's uh, books on uh, your basic, you know, chord structures. There's books on styles of music, you know, whether it is a funk and there's history books about who made music when. And all this stuff, you can try to pursue it and find out as much knowledge as you can because what this will do for you, it'll give you a chance to uh, apply things to your bass and you'll be able to expand, expand to things beyond what the bass player's been doing for years. So the well, first thing I want to talk about, though, is how to practice. When you get your first instrument, your bass, you're always trying to find out your favorite tune, you know, whether it's like a rock band or anything like that. And so you do that for 15 years. You're playing this one favorite tune. What you want to try to do is you want to try to practice and find things to practice. Like I said, you want to go to teachers. But also, when you get the material, you want to sit down and allot yourself some time each day and maybe a half an hour or an hour each day and practice things. If the teacher gives you a major scale, try that, okay? And try to get everything together. It might be boring to begin with. It might be boring and you may say, oh, this is not gonna pertain, but you'll see all this stuff builds up. These are the building blocks which you make your music out of, okay? And you wanna practice maybe in a secluded room, maybe like your cellar or you know, maybe an attic or something where you can get away from everybody, you don't have phones ringing and everything. And you want to have yourself a metronome. That's where a timekeeper that just clicks. And you can keep your time with that. And I usually always practice with the metronome. And when you do something, you're practicing, you get stuck, you say, I want to do a C major scale. Oh, I screwed up. Don't start again from the beginning. Try to figure out where you're making a problem and strain it out. And always start slow and then build speed. Okay, you want consistent and steady progress. Okay, what this is is that if you learn something one day, you got that down. You say, great, I'm going to go have a soda because I have this together. The next day, you turn around and you're trying to get that together and you don't really have that happening again. You're going to say, gee, I forgot what I did yesterday. You don't want to do that. You want to learn something and you want to retain it and be consistent with it. Okay? Now, let's go through the book. What I'm going to do with, with the video here, I'm going to build it up where I show you the introduction, I'm going to show you some basics, and then we're going to try some tunes, okay? Now, I wrote a book, too, that's also polyphonic lecture bass number one, which goes through some of this stuff in more detail, and you might want to pick that up, too, because that'll help you get, you know, maybe figure some more things out, because I hit some other spots where I can't hit on the video because I only have an hour here. And what I'm going to do is I want you to, I want you to look at all the things I'm doing, and maybe if you have a problem, stop the tape, and then work on it, and then move on. Don't watch the whole tape and then get to the end and say, wow, that's crazy what he's doing there. I wonder how I built to that point. What I'm gonna try to do is build up to that point in the end, okay? Let's look at the bass first. The action on the bass is very important. What you wanna do is you wanna have action that's low enough to play normal, you know, that you can play regular notes, but also tap. So like I can pop with my action. You know, I can pop with it or I can play normal. Or I can tap, you know? 
which you know is important to do all the techniques you know because what happens is you know if you get on a gig and you say gee you're doing something maybe the end it would be nice to throw in notes because you want to finish out a tune or something like that it's always nice to have the action to do anything as you learn more about the technique you'll figure out well maybe i can load the g string a little you know maybe you want to take your bass to a repairman and have him look at the neck and check sure you know make sure it's straight and also look at all the frets and make sure they're well rounded and what I do is I usually have a repairman always check my bass like half a year just see like what the wear's like and stuff like that what they can do is they can set your action up straight and then you you know you can play with the uh, adjustments back on the bridge as you're practicing the thing okay now let me tune for you here this is going to be a G on the G string I'm going to play a harmonic so you can get it a little easier and that's a G here it is again Okay, let's move on to basics. What you want to do when you're tapping, what you want to do is you want to use just one hand and you want to hit the string onto the fretboard. And what I'm doing, I'm tapping a C on the A string. And all I'm doing is just hitting it on. And it makes a note because the metal hits the metal, the metal string hits the metal fret and it produces a tone. And what happens when you want to leave the note off, it just lifts your finger up, okay? And this gets complicated when you start adding all the fingers. We're going to be tapping with all the fingers on both hands. And, you know, you can be anywhere on the fretboard, you should be able to tap notes. So now here I'm going to give you some exercises how to do this. Now let's start with the left hand first, and let's tap a C major scale. And starting on the E string, okay? So I'm going to tap a C major scale for you. And just remember, just hit the, the string onto the neck. Okay, here we go. All that was is just a C major scale. It's very easy. You guys probably know this already from earlier playing. Okay, now that's ascending lines, okay? Now I'm going to show you what it's like for the right hand. And this is going to be new. And we're just going to do a C major scale again, an octave higher. Okay, here we go. We're starting on C on the A string. Here's your C major scale. major scale got it how about both hands this is where things start getting complicated now when you have a line that's going to be the exact same you can use the exact same finger for both hands this is something that really works out nice is that second finger on C on the E string is the same with the right hand second finger C on the A string okay now you want to be sure when you're doing this to keep your thumb behind your neck on this hand so it don't look like this and try to keep it open like that and also keep your thumb on top of the neck or the fret markers are. This makes it a point of reference for you when you're moving around playing something. You don't have to look at your bass to say, oh, I know where I am. I'm at C. Okay, so you want to try to keep that hand position like that. Uh, another thing about it is that if you keep your hand there, it's a little bit more open to do things. Okay, so let's try the C major scale together. Now, the left hand's going to do the same thing it did before, and the right hand's going to do the same thing. We're just going to do them together. So here's your C major scale sending. Another problem we have here is string crossing when you're moving between strings and also muting. If I play something and I move on to something else, sometimes other strings will ring. So you got to cover strings that you're not playing. So you only want the note that you're tapping to sound. So if I'm playing the C here, these fingers are going to lay on the other strings, the A, D, G string, and my E string is going to be sounding. So I'm thinking to myself, I want the E string to sound. Now, if I'm playing the right hand with that too, like C major scale again, I'm just playing C's on both hands. I'm thinking, God, I want uh, E and A to ring, and I don't want D and G, you know? So what I do is I lay fingers over here on D and G, and I just keep these strings ringing. And it gets a little more complicated as you move down. When I get to F, I have to watch the E string, where you get a, you hear that rumble down there? It makes quite a mess, so you gotta watch that. Okay, so that's ascending. It's not much to it. You just tap the notes on. And you want to try to hold them as long as you can before you go to the next note, because a lot of people have the tendency to do this. 
real choppy. You want to try to make it like you're moving nice and slow to the next note. Okay, let's try descending. Okay, let's do the same thing. We're going to take the left hand again, and I'm going to go down a C major scale. Okay, I'm going to start at the top, but I'm going to tap it down. Now, there's two things you can do. You can tap each note like this, or you can do pull-offs. What I do is I usually tap, but pull-offs are is where you're going to hit a note, and then you're going to pull off to the next one, where I'm hitting a B flat, and I'm pulling off to a G. Okay, here you can hear the string. It's just like if you were playing over here. It's just like you're pulling the string with a finger, but you're just pulling one on the same hand. I think some of the other players like to do that. I like to tap both notes, like, um, to get a better attack, a stronger attack, because the bass is really low, and it usually gets kind of muddled down there. You have to get more distinction in the sound. So let's try tapping on the left hand. We're going to go down to C major scale. Here it is. Okay? Now what that was, it was just the C major scales we've been doing before. Now you should try pull off to see if maybe you like it, okay? You want to pull off each note, tap the first one, then pull off the next one, okay? Uh, now let's try, after you try that, let's try the right hand. This is a little tricky here because your fingers are probably going to be weak. So try to get a good sound and try to hold the notes out as long as you can. I'm going to do the same thing, C major scale, an octave higher, same fingering, okay? We're going to start on C on the G string. There you go, and of course, let's combine them. Okay, now this same thing again. Remember to watch your string, string crossing, your muting of the strings you're not using, okay? And let's try it together. Same fingering, C major scale going down. I'm starting with C on the G string on the right hand and C on the D string with the left hand. Here we go. There you go. Now you want to get it real clean. Make sure you get it very clean and very precise and very consistent. Like I said before, work on this for maybe a week to make sure you get that straightened out before you move on. That way, then you can always do that. And when you get onto the harder things, you're, gonna, you're not going to get you're caught up on yourself because you're going to say, "Well, I can't do the C major scale, so I can't do any of the harder stuff." Get that down first, and then move on. Okay. Remember also to try pull-offs. You want to try that on anything because maybe that will fit your style better than tapping does. So what I do, I tap, but maybe pull-offs might be better for you, okay? Now, the way we notate this music when we have two hands, we're going to use the bass clef for the left hand and the treble clef for the right hand. Okay, what the treble clef is, you probably aren't real familiar with it. That's uh, the notes, like if you ever saw piano music, you'll see the bass clef on the one side, on the bottom, and you'll see the treble clef on the top. You're usually playing just the bass clef, that's where the bass is. But we're going to add the treble clef, and what that is, it's going to notate the upper notes on the right hand. This is just like the piano. If a piano player sits down, his left hand will be playing the bass clef, and his right hand will be playing the treble clef. So I'm going to use the same thing with bass, because it has to notate, you know, more notes at a higher range. So if, uh, if you're going to add the treble clef, you're going to have to understand what the spaces are on it. It's F, A, C, E from the lowest to the highest. The first space is F. The next space is A, the next space is C, and the top space is E. And of course, it works the same between an F and an A, you're going to have a G. And I, it, it goes the same as the bass clef. So if you're familiar with bass clef, you should try to get, you know, treble clef shouldn't be too hard, but you're going to probably have a problem right away reading it. Again, if you have a problem, go to a teacher, a guitarist, or a keyboard, a guy who knows what's going on, and say, what is this? How come I don't understand that? Because you'll find out in two minutes, he'll tell you exactly what you need to know instead of sit there and pondering about it, okay? So, we're going to move on from there, and you'll notice how the things are notated with treble clef and also bass clef, okay? And remember, I want to go over this one more time, just remember your finger positions and your hand positions. You know, we're going to look at C again, and I'm going to play a C major scale going up and down. But look how the fingers are staying on each string they want to play, and they're watching the strings they're not using, and the hands, the thumb is staying behind the neck, and the thumb staying on top of the neck on the right hand. So let's see a C major scale again here.
Now don't stop there. Go to all the other scales. How about B? Okay, go through them all and get the feel of your fingerboard. If you're going to be doing a G, that's totally different. The spacing is different than doing a C, okay? So move chromatically up and down, you know, don't just do one exercise. Move it all over the bass and actually learn the bass like that. Um, let's look at some other exercises I can give you to help you develop this. There's another thing you can do called finger sequences. What I did is I went through all the consecutive finger sequences, okay? And let me show you one. Let's show you two, one, three, four. What this is, I assign a number to each finger. Second finger, uh, third finger, fourth finger, and this is first finger, okay? So if I say two, one, three, four, I would say two on second finger, one, first finger, third finger, fourth finger. And what I do is when I go through these, I usually start way at the bottom here on F. And I just go through them all, I go up and I come back down and I reverse it. So let's look at one, do a little bit of one finger exercise and I'll give you some other ones to do that might uh, work for you. But you can go through them and all and write them all out, the consecutive fingering, to get better and to learn the bass. You have to do a lot of beginning work to straighten this out to get a good sound right away. Okay, here's, here's two, one, three, four, I'll do a little of this for you. And you want to work your way all the way up the neck. You know, when you get to the top and go through the whole thing. Now, the way to figure out the finger sequences is to start with one, two, three, four. Remember, you'll be doing that backwards, coming back down. And then one, two, four, three, one, three, two, four, one, three, four, two. All I'm doing is just going to the next numbers and then changing the alternate numbers. If you write it down on paper, you probably can figure it out easier. Start with one, two, three, four, one, two, four, three, and go through those. And you can also start, you know, with three, one, two, four. Three, one, four, two. All these finger exercises should work out. I'm leave that up to you to sit down and do that because it's a lot of time. But try to spend one week with each finger exercise and get together. And by the end, you'll be able to play anything anywhere. That's the kind of the homework you have to do to do this. Uh, let me look into something else here. Let's look into string crossing a little. What this is, like I was talking before, this is the hard thing to do, is to move between one string and then jump to another one, okay? And then you're jumping around. That's the problem. So let me show you what I would do for that. I would spell out some thirds. The major scale, remember we're doing C major scale, just the same thing, but we're going to do it in thirds. We're going to do C to E, D to F, E to G, F to A, so on and so forth. And what I'll be doing is in both hands, I'll be doing the same thing. And remember, the, the, my fingers that I'm using are the same on both hands. Let me show you that left hand first and then right hand. So here's thirds on the left hand and the key is C. All right, that was the thirds in the left hand. Let's look at the right hand. Same thing, C, E, D, F, which is a C major scale in thirds, okay? And here we go, starting on the second finger. Let's throw these together and see what we got. Same thing, just putting both hands together. Now, if you watch my hands, you see the fingers like covering strings because I say, uh-oh, the E string's ringing. So I'm going to cover that while I'm up here, you know, maybe on these C's up here and I hear it. Oh, the E string, I'm going to cover that. So you just keep your hands, the fingers aware of each string and what's happening. Another thing is, uh, some players like to use round rounds all the time when they're playing. I used to like, with this technique, I think of half rounds. You might want to try that too. If you have a problem getting the sound out of this, you've been working on these things I've been showing you, saying, God, I can't get that sound he's getting. Just try half rounds. You might want to get uh, 
you know, pack of strings to try it out, and I use a light gauge. And what happens is it's usually a little easier to go back and forth, and it gives you a pretty good sound. And flat rounds are kind of, they're kind of a drag because they usually die right away. But round rounds, man, when you're on those, they usually sound like you're screeching all over and your fingers get all chewed up because you're using a heavier gate, you know, a string that has more of a roughness to it. Okay, that was basics. And what I want you to do is to repeat that and make sure you learn it really good before we go on because what happens if you don't learn point A, you can't, you know, you can't run until you walk. And just spend maybe a week or two on that and then you can get into some of these other exercises and it's going to make a lot of sense to you when you say, oh, that's all you're doing. But if you don't know how to do the basic things, you know, you're never going to be able to, to get further on. So run the tape back and go over it again and make sure you know it, okay? Now we're going to move into cording. Now, let's go back again to the C major scale, which you probably have ingrained, and let's look at what you can build from a C major scale. Now, when you have a scale, I don't know if you know this, but you can build chords through the scale. What I mean is that I might start on C, and I'll build a chord on top of that. Now, each chord is the root, third, and fifth. What that is, is just the thirds again coming up. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play through a C major scale, and I'm gonna show you the chords that you can build. You can have C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor, B diminished, and then your C major. Okay? Now what we can do with tapping we can play all these chords as they come up. So we'll take a C major scale again. Now let's tap out the notes. Let's take the root for the C would be the C, the third would be the E, the fifth would be a G, and then we're, I'm going to put an octave on top. So look, I'm going to go through the whole chord now. I'm going to play C major, which is one, three, five, C, E, G. Here's D minor which is D, F, A. Here's E minor. It's e, G, B. F major. F, A, C. Here's your G major. G, B, D. A minor. A, C, E. B diminished. Which is B, D, F, B, and then back to C major. Now all I did was I took the basic uh, note, I took the first note of the scale, and I put the root, the third, the fifth, on top of each note. So you have C major, D minor, and that's how we get the chords. Now when you play these, you can go through and voice these different ways on the bass. Now most times, bass players, when they play chords, they'd be real muddy. And they'd be laying things like that on, every now and then they come up with that, which is nice. But with tapping, you can define chords just like a guitar player or a keyboardist. Yeah, I'll look at C major again. Uh, in the, note, the notes of C, E, G, and there's a lot of ways you can play that on the bass. Now, if I'm going to play that with uh, triple stops on the bass, it would sound like this. That's a C, E, G, okay? It's like, it's mud. But if you take it and split it apart, I'm going to put a C in the bottom, which is on the E string, a G on the A string, uh, E on the D string, and a C on the top on the G string. All of a sudden you can hear what I'm playing. Now there's different ways to voice this. There's another way, that's a C on the bottom, nothing on the A string, an E and a G. All right, you can, um, how about this one? That's just C, a C and an E. But you notice you can do a whole bunch of things. You're not limited to just playing, um, you know, triple stops around the bass. But you can get very muddy. You can also do things like you might want at the end of a song, just add like the last chord in, maybe in a ballad or something. You can double all your notes. This is just me playing all C's. I'm implying a C major chord. Or you can put, you know, maybe something like uh, that or something else. You know, you can work your way and learn all the chords. Now, the thing to learn about this is to learn the notes in each chord. Now, a major chord is made up of a major third and then a minor third. That's the interval between the root and the third and the third and the fifth. So I got between C and E's a major third and then a minor third. If it was a minor chord, it'd be a minor third and then a major third. So that'd be C to E flat, 
and an E flat to G it would be a minor chord. That would be minor third, major third. If it's diminished, that's the weird one at the seventh. If it's diminished, you want to have both minor thirds. So that would be C to E and an E to G flat. Okay, that's a diminished chord. It occurs on the seventh. And an augmented is both major thirds, which is the only one we left out, which would be C to E and E to G sharp. All right, which sounds kind of like this. You can get that train wreck sound out of it. Okay, uh, let's move on and look at the functions of the chords. Now, chords go together. They have, each chord has a certain function. If we're going to assign a number to each chord in the C major scale, we get one for C major, two for D minor, three for E minor, four for F major, five for G major, six for A minor. B diminishes the seven chord. Now, each of these have functions. The one chord functions as the tonic. We call that the tonic or uh, the root, okay? The two chord that functions as a subdominant, okay? The three chord is a median. Four chord is subdominant. Five chord is dominant. Six chord is median again. And your seven chord, that's uh, dominant. And now, you probably hear something different in the chords I'm playing, okay? That, we're back to one with the tonic again. And you hear the chords I'm playing, and what I'm doing is putting sevenths on there. We're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, now, the general rule, the golden rule for chords to go to chords is subdominant, dominant, tonic, okay? So I would say that if I'm gonna make a chord progression, which means a bunch of chords that go together and sound pretty, I might go subdominant, dominant, tonic. Now, subdominant is four chord, going to a dominant, maybe a five, going to tonic, one, okay? So here's four, okay, five, one. Makes lots of sense. If I play that backwards, it won't make so much sense. Here's one, five, four, okay? It doesn't, doesn't quite fill you out. Uh, you will remember that the medians are substitutions for the tonic chord. So instead of going, you could go four, five, maybe to three, and then move on from there, okay? But you want to look at, write out all these functions and then play different patterns for yourself with the chords. Okay, let's look at sevenths. All I'm doing with sevenths is I'm putting in the another third on top of the one, three, five. So I go one, three, five, and then the third above that. That's C, E, G, and I'd go third in the major scale would be a B. Okay, so all of a sudden I have, sounds like a jazz voicing, okay? There's your C, G, E, and B. Now, I'm trying to voice these further apart. You're going to notice in your chording that the further apart you have the voices, the nicer it's going to sound. You know, I mean, same thing as if we were playing that same chord like this. You don't really hear what's happening, but if I split that all apart and I bring that out like that, you can hear all the different voicings. Um, we're going to add sevenths onto everything. Here's your D minor seventh, D, F, A, C. E minor seventh, E, B, G, D. That's your F major seventh. I'm leaving out the fifth here. It's F, A, C, E. G dominant seventh, very important. That's the five chord. That's the dominant that goes back to the one. You can usually tell a key through that because the five always resolves to one. Okay, five is G, B, D, F. Your A minor, okay, that's A, and I'm putting I'm leaving out the, the fifth again. It's A, C, E, G, and your B diminished. All right, it's B, D, F, A, and back to C. Okay, now that's the different voices you can use. When you're gonna be playing out and looking at people's chording, you know, like I said before, go back to teachers, and a guitarist or a keyboardist will always show you this stuff. This is common knowledge for them. They know how to move chords around. But when you're going out and playing, be careful where you're putting things. You know, maybe something, somebody has a seventh and you don't, and it might not work real good together. So what I usually do is after a job, I'll go ask the keyboard player, well, what was the voice you used on such and such a course? And then I would try to build it for myself. Okay? And you can add nines on top of that. We're not going to get into that too much real here, but I can add a C9. All that is is another third on top of the seventh. Okay? You have 11th and 13th. That gets into the jazz territory. When you're beginning out, try to stay in with just your uh, beginning chords and your beginning triads, okay? Build your own uh, chord cadences and stuff, you know, with your subdominant, dominant, tonic rule, okay? You can maybe do a two, five, one, which would be two, five, 
one, like that, okay, which is a basic chord in jazz. And what you can do is if you start working through more chords, you're going to find out your voice leading. Instead of making everything real block chordy, okay, going to things like that, you can get your voice leading happening, trying to get chords and moving to each other. Now, the only way you're going to learn all this stuff is by, you know, studying it in a book and working it out for yourself, because it does take a while to learn that. But it'll be very rewarding if you get it. One more thing with chording. I want to do one example for you, and I want to show you one more thing is that which throws some people, is that you can have inversions of chords, okay? Let's go back to C, E, G again. That's this, and that's tap. Instead of having C on the bottom, I might want to put a G on the bottom, okay? It's still a C, E, G chord, but there's a different note that's sounding lowest. That's G, E, C. Okay, now people say, gee, that sounds like a C major, but I can't really tell what it is, because they don't hear that lowest note. So when you're looking at inversions, remember you can have either a third, or the fifth, or the seventh in the bass, okay? And then pop notation, that's usually notated with uh, like a C over a G, with a slash over a G, and you can say, oh, that's what it's happening, because normally bass players just say, oh, and all they want is a G there, but actually what's happening is they want a C chord with a, you know, over a G, okay? Now let's move, let's look into uh, some more examples in C major. Let's do just a few more. Um, let's try a subdominant to a dominant to a median, and then subdominant, dominant, tonic, okay? Maybe you should write some of this stuff out and look at it on paper and see how I fit in the rules, okay? Remember the rule of subdominant, dominant, tonic, and tonic, and median substitute for tonics. Okay, let's go, um, how about uh, two, five, three, four, five, one, okay? Here's what's gonna sound, I'm gonna use the sevenths this time, okay? Here's two, five, three, four, five, one, okay? Um, you know, if you want to substitute in the end, like I was saying before, you can put nines on top or sevens, okay? But do you hear how that works out? Now, let me play that. On, try one more here. Let's go to A minor. Let's do four, five, six, two, five, one. All right, two, five, one, okay? Now, that, what that is, I'm just going with this rule, and I'm just building chords. You know, maybe you want to try it backwards. Let's try this one backwards. How about one... Uh, five, two, six, five, four. Uh, so it'd be one, five, two. Doesn't really give you a sense of, of resting, okay? And then six, five, four, which would be. Okay? See, it's hard for me to play because I'm like trying to think. You never run chords that way. They don't resolve each other. Leading tones don't resolve, which are like half step above below the next note. They don't resolve, so I'm trying to think where it's going. But you can hear it's like. It's like a feeling of just hesitation. It doesn't sound like it really resolves. And that's the basic rules of music where you're getting your chords. Okay? Now, let's move on to the rhythm. The thing we've been doing so far is just playing real simple notes. And we haven't been getting any rhythm in each hand. What you got to do is you got to get uh, different things happening in both hands. Okay? What happens is when you're first learning this, you gotta, you start, you know, you're so used to playing a note, a note is starting over here and you're fretting it on the left hand. You're so used to saying, they both are gonna happen together. No matter what I do, they happen together. Now we're gonna change that all around and I want you to make them separate, okay? Each hand should be independent, just like a drummer. If you ever watch a drummer, he can do anything with each hand and then his feet. Okay, and that's another good thing when I go through some of these things. Maybe you want to try to get with a drummer to see how to beat these things out. And, you know, we can do that with the sticks and show you, like, how I'm doing this. All I'm going to do, let me try some examples for you just to show you what I'm talking about. Is let me play eighth notes in the right hand and quarter notes in the left. Let's try that. All right, let's do it backwards, of course. Uh, quarter notes in the right, eighth notes in the left. All right, and you can use any rhythm. You can do um, maybe how about a dotted eighth and a sixteenth. All right, and you can switch that around. Okay, now we're going to work, you'll see later as we apply these things, how this rhythm's going to help. Another thing to work on with that, you know, maybe you want to write yourself out some rhythms for the right hand, and then write out some rhythms on the left, and then try to read it down and see how they hit together. See what hits together, and see what hits after each other, and you can see how things work. 
okay? Another thing to do with that, which I did, which helped me a lot, I would play something on the left hand, just basic, something very easy, and I would write my name out. And he'd say, all of a sudden you hear your left hand speed up or slow down. You want to try to get your, your name not in time, and you want to be able to do something with your other hand, you know, maybe drink, drink a Coke or something like that, and then do the same thing, you know? Maybe comb your hair with the other hand, just to get the fact that the brain's going to think these guys are not connected anymore, and they're going to be able to do their own thing, okay? So now we looked at basically all the beginning material. Now I'm going to show you some pieces that you can play and that you can use on your bass for anything in a band by yourself, okay? And that was basically, remember to go over the basics and the chording and the rhythm that I just went through here and try to get all that stuff down before you move on because that way then you can move on and you can say, ah, oh, I got that all together and now I'm ready for whatever he has to show me, okay? And I'm going to show you how to apply all that stuff I just talked about. I know it's probably a lot to go through right now, but remember, get with teachers and try to digest all this information, you know, maybe work on it, make a practice plan for yourself. Let me, let me show you something. We're going to do something with chording, okay? Okay, what I did right there, I was just going between a one minor chord and a four uh, dominant seventh chord. And what I was doing is I was rolling the top notes, the B flat to an A. Okay, now let me play it real slow for you so you can catch some of that. with a C major chord. And look what I'm doing. The left hand is just marking the downbeats and every now and then throwing between a C and an F, throwing in, you know, a, a jab here and there, syncopated. The right hand is keeping the rhythm. This is just like a piano lick. And you might hear someone like Richard T play something like this. What it is, it's just going back and forth like that. And I'm bouncing off. Now you see how those are back and forth, like I was talking before. You're not going to have everything happen together. It would sound like, it would sound like you're going to have to make this with the polyphony. You're going to have to make things happen at different times, okay? Okay? So that's C minor to F7. And that's a jam you can put in a song. If they go, they say, go to the bass player for something, instead of going... Throw this in. And then go back out, you know, back into your bass line. And everybody go, wow, what's he doing? And the piano players will get jealous. Um, what is this? Just remember, it's just going from a one minor chord to a, a four dominant seventh. And remember, you can't, you know, you're not gonna have to wait to a tune in the key of C to do this. You can move it in the key of B flat. Key B flat would be B flat minor to E flat seven. Okay? A flat would be a flat minor to D flat seven, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm just going to different keys, just remember the functions of the chords. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna look into uh, the blues right now. We're gonna try something else, and this is more chording, and I'm gonna go into the blues changes, all right? Now this is a common thing. We're gonna do the jazz blues changes. I'm gonna show you some more things. Um, let's be, let me play it for you first, and I'll talk about it. Now, almost every player knows the blues. It's something you should learn chording because it works out real fine. What it is, is just one chord to the four chord, back to the one chord. And then in jazz, they usually go two, five, one. And it's, so in B flat, I'm going from B flat seven to E flat seven to B flat seven. Then you're E flat seven, okay, back to E flat, or B flat. Then you want, I want C minor, I put a little tag in there, 
251 into C, which is the two quarter B flat, and then five, the F7, one. Okay? Well, let me play again, and I'm gonna add a little rhythm in there. You can hear I'm gonna comp. Now you could comp behind a sax player or something like that. So let me try this for you. Let me run through real quickly the chord notes I'm playing. I'm playing the root, fifth, third, and seventh for the B flat, okay? For the E flat, I'm going root, seventh, third, for the B flat, back to the fifth, third, seventh. And now for the D minor, I'm going root, fifth, third, seventh, root, seventh, third, that's root fifth, third, seventh, root third, or root seventh, third, and then back to B flat, okay? So work on some more voices. Maybe if you guys are into jazz or whatever you're gonna do, look at the chords that are in your music that you're working with, and then line out the notes and then try to fit them on your bass. And try to use the same voices that I am. You know, take one chord apart and look exactly how the factors I'm using. Okay, now I'm gonna work on look into melody with accompaniment. Now there were some pieces with chords. Now let's try to put things together. I'm gonna to give you a melody on the right hand and I'm gonna give you an accompaniment with the left hand. Here's a tune for you. Just watch this. I'm gonna play it fast first. probably pretty familiar to you. Uh, what I'm doing on the left hand, I'm just kind of basically giving the rhythm comps. It's your famous old 1-5-1. One, one. My chords are just one, and I go to five chord, and I go back to one. Now the thing is, you gotta run, learn the melody on the right hand. Now I'm gonna play the right hand slow for you, okay? But let me do this one slow, and just the right hand, the left hand, you won't be hearing the left hand. If you have any problems trying to get these together, learn one hand first and then learn the left hand. So the left hand is probably pretty easy. You can probably get that happening. That's just, you know, you've probably been used to doing that already. Now then learn the right hand and then put them together. All right? And that's, that's kind of fun tune you can put in between, you know, anything and play it for your parents and impress them. A lot of things I do. Um, with the bass is like I look into some traditional pieces and I also look into some you know just through the whole musical category like I'll do something maybe funky and then something rocky and I'll move on to maybe a, a fun piece just to get a, a good wide selection of stuff for the bass let me do something else for you and I'm gonna add remember we just did the blues changes and B flat now let's put a melody on top of that
All right. Uh, what that was was a classic jazz tune. And all I did is I put that on top of the blues changes that you already know. And what I did is in the bottom hand, I just held the roots of each chord. Now let's look what the left hand was doing. What that was, is that was the melody up here, and then I put it down here in the bottom. And the same thing with this, if you have a problem putting it together, practice one, get that together, and then put the other hand with it. And maybe, maybe when you start out, you might want to do it real slow. So you got some speed to build in. All right, and then you can move faster. And then if you have a problem with this, don't practice this. Practice the part that's hard. Move it around. Okay, move it around the fretboard, and that way you can learn just the part you have trouble. Everybody always wants to start back at the beginning. And that's real far away from where you're having a problem. So what you should do is go back to where you're having a problem. And in the end, what I did is I did a famous Ellington thing. What I did is I, I came off of the tag I did. What I did is I put the third coming up to the fourth, flat five, five, and then I put a nine chord in the end, which is D e flat, F, D, and a C. Okay? There's two pieces for you with melody accompaniment, and remember, you know, work one over first, learn that, and then move on. And now we're going to look at one more thing, independence between both hands. Now there were some things that were just some basic little pieces. Now I'm going to look into one more thing, and this is called independence between hands. This is where each hand, this is the true meaning of polyphonic, it's where each hand is going to be playing a melody. And they work together and they talk to each other. And let me play a piece for you. And what that was, it was hands talking to each other, or melodies talking to each other, or note, you know, the, the voices were talking to each other where I had two voices basically, and one would state an idea and the other one would repeat it. Now this was a thing that was big in classical times. It was called an invention or a fugue. And a funny story goes with this. When I went to college, everybody at college told me that rock was no good. They said, what you can, you know, where's it going to get you? You have long hair. What are you doing? Because they were all in the classical, and they wanted to hear nothing about Motley Crue or any of these other bands. And what happens was, subsequently, I almost didn't get through school because I said, you know, I need contemporary music is really good. But don't do this to you. I mean, don't look at, just say that uh, pop music is really good and classical isn't any good. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be missing. You're going to be doing the same things that people at college did. You're going to be missing a whole generation of music. There's 200 years of classical music, and you can apply this to your playing. Let me play this through a little and show you what I'm talking about. What the voices are doing, the one hand's going to stay an idea, and the other hand is going to uh, answer it. Here's the first idea. Now the second hand's going to come out and say that again. And again. And 
then it's going to develop the idea. And then here's your cadence. Now left hand's talking. Now we're going to develop it more. Right hand. Now here's a break. Cadence again. Now look at the idea. It's going to come back in the left hand backwards. Final cadence. See how the ideas are talking to each other? They're saying, um, here I'm stating an idea, and my other hand saying, okay, I like that, I'm gonna move on. Now, that's a real complicated thing to do. It's even further than, you know, I mean, doing your rhythm ideas. You have rhythm happening, you have to talk to each other, and then the idea comes back and it's inverted. See, that's a very, very, very complex thing, and you should look back into the classical era. They had all kinds of things like chorales and fugues and inventions, and you should look into Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, all these guys, and see what they're doing. They had really good voice leading. You can use for harmonies, you can use for vocal, you can use for almost anything. And you can use classical music just, you know, in middle of tunes. A lot of rock bands are doing that now where they're putting just classical music here and there and using like horn things that are very classical. Okay, so I'm going to let you work on that. And remember, any problem in the tape, just go back and go over that one section. Try to go over things, you know, slowly and maybe, you know, try to slow something down if you can see what I'm doing, okay? So there were a lot of pieces for you to play. And I'm going to sum it up by trying to point out some major points that you should try to get out of this video. Uh, when you're doing polyphonic, you know, try to get all the basics happening. Get your basic exercises done before that. And then look where to apply it. Listen to, to players. You know, whether it's a saxophone player, a keyboard player, or a guitar player. Everybody's doing musical ideas. And you should try to pick up on what things that are happening. And also go to teachers and try to get as much information as you can on, you know, outside things. You might, want to, you might find out how to play a better country line, you know, through getting a tape on a guitar, you know, instead of just looking at bass. Don't think that you're limited to just the bass, you know, because there's not that much material for it. Try to branch out and look at everything, you know, and always work hard, you know, go for, pursue knowledge, work hard, and, you know, when you get something down, use it and be very consistent in your playing. You can use the polyphonic bass for, you know, solos. You could do a solo or you want to play for someone, you can finally do a piece for yourself. Uh, in a trio, it works so great. If it's just a bass, drum, and keyboard player or bass, drum, and guitar player, you can put the chords behind someone while somebody else is soloing because they can't do the chords at the same time. So you can add the bass line and, the, you know, the solo, whatever it is. What you want to do is, you know, work real hard and try to get all the styles down too. Make sure you try to get everything like country, jazz, funk, rock, and work at everything. Okay, so practice very hard and go over the tape if you have a problem and remember to get with teachers. Thanks a lot. This is Chell Benner and we're going to sign off with some music here.